Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this lecture, I wanted to discuss the tafsir of Surah At-Takathur. So the content of the surah is actually very much similar to the previous surahs that we have been examining, where Allah is constantly reminding the reader that as this Quran now comes towards an end, we need to take life more seriously. We need to take religion more seriously because the day of judgment is coming very close. The time when the doors of Tawbah will be closed is coming very close. And so there basically is less and less time for us to waste because we are engulfed in depression and grief, anxiety or fear of failing, you know, fear of the future. So in the beginning of this surah, Allah starts off by saying competition in increase diverts you. So it's a very beautiful statement. There is no oath that is being taken. There is no rhetorical question that is being asked. It's just a plain statement. And again, in the eyes of Allah, it's a fact. The fact being that competition in terms of this dunya, this race to try and acquire as much as we possibly can, this race to be better than you know, the people around us, this is what really is diverting us and distracting us from the thing that really matters. And Allah tells us that it keeps diverting us until you visit the graveyards. So until we do not face death, this dunya is a constant destruction. And clearly uh, what that means is that regardless of how much of the Quran you study, regardless of how much you try and build your association with Allah, if you don't remain vigilant, then over time your association with God will start to diminish and you will start to move back towards dunya because that's the way dunya has been designed. Not only is this world being created in such a manner that everything is just so attractive, but more than that, we have been created in such a way, our, our physical human bodies have been designed in such a way that it yearns for this dunya. It is actually pulled towards this dunya. So the minute you start to decrease the amount of time you engage in zikr, without even realizing it, you start to move off track. And that's why Allah says, until we don't hit, hit the grave, this constant distraction will always be there. And this competition to always be better than the others, that need will always be inside of us. Now, of course, we could always ask this question, why is it that this need, this desire to compete with other people, this desire to attain more and more of dunya, why does it go on inside of us until we hit the grave? In other words, why can we not make this argument that if I just have a couple of things, you know, th that I'm trying to strive for, like good grades, a, a good job, a good career, a decent amount of income, as soon as I get these four or five things, I will not be in that competition. I will not be in that race for dunya anymore because these are the only four or five things that I need. And other than that, I will have complete satisfaction and I will have so much long-term happiness that I won't, I, I won't have a desire to be chasing this dunya anymore. In fact, at that point, I can spend a lot of time chasing Allah because I have the basic five elements that I need in my life. The reason why that statement is actually false, it doesn't make any sense and Allah is actually clarifying in the surah that that statement doesn't make sense, is because we have unlimited wants. And this is precisely what economics has proven. This is precisely what business companies, firms, this is what they take advantage of, that human beings have been created in such a way that they're never fully happy. They're never fully satisfied. No matter what they have, they want the next best thing. This, in fact, is, you know, why we have uh, those kinds of terms that come up, those expressions like the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, that no matter what you have finally worked hard for and achieved, you might be happy for a couple of days, but then after that, your brain starts to search for something else. Because as human beings, we are designed in such a way that we always have to set a goal for ourselves and we always have to be chasing something. So in other words, the fact that Allah is making it very clear over here that competition in terms of dunya is something that will divert us and it will continue diverting us until we reach the grave is something proven in fact by economics. Because economics theory tells us that the very first important thing we need to know is that insan has unlimited wants. His wants are infinite. They can never be fully satisfied. He will always be chasing this world and he will get stuck inside the cycle of greed. And, you know, in fact, we can even see this inside of ourselves, you know, so when we're young, when we're kids, we're always trying to 
um, you know, chase our parents, right? We're always trying to make our parents proud. We're always trying to accomplish things that will make them happy. Then as we get older, we enter into our teenage years. And then at that point, the next idol that we have created in our minds are our friends. You know, so always making our friends happy, always trying to be on their good side, uh, always pleasing them, uh, trying to fit into the crowd. This becomes very important. And that's why we start to feel this uh, immense amount of peer pressure, right? So you always have to conform to the group. If everyone is thinking in a certain way, then it's always safe to think in the exact same way as everyone else, because you always have this desire to fit in, right? You have this need to just make everyone around you happy. And this is something that we all experience. And then as we get older and, you know, when we become uh, adults, then our next idol becomes our career or it might become our spouse. And then eventually, as we get even more older, then the next idol becomes our children because we always have to make them happy. We're terrified of, of losing them. It just never ends. There's always someone or there's always something that we are trying to attain. And it just goes on and on until we finally end up reaching the grave. And, you know, the interesting thing about all of this is that when I was a student of economics, what I could never understand is that the first thing we're told is that insan has unlimited wants and that if you are a rational human being, then you will be trying to chase those unlimited wants and you will be try trying to maximize your satisfaction. And that in itself does not make sense because how can you maximize satisfaction when your wants cannot be maximized, when your wants just go on and on and on forever, right? So when you're chasing something that can never be attained because it is unlimited, right? It can never be fully quantified, then how can you ever attain it? That in itself, it never made sense to me. So the entire theory upon which uh, the foundation of economics is based, that in itself doesn't make any sense because it is encouraging us to chase this dream that can never be attained because that dream is in itself infinite. That dream is in itself unlimited. And from the very beginning, this is what me and you, we all are taught. When we are very young, society and the standards of society uh, teach us these things through college, through university, school, and even just through so social media. This is the message that we are being told. That if you want to be happy, chase this dunya because that's what a smart and rational person will do. And we are not given an opportunity to stop and think and ask, how can I possibly ever uh, maximize my happiness when I'm chasing something that economics is telling me is infinite and it cannot possibly be quantified. And then at the same time, you know, how can you gain something that does not even exist? So the mere fact that economics wants us to maximize our satisfaction, it wants to maximize our happiness, that term is in itself a, a big problem because happiness, long-term happiness, long-term satisfaction, that doesn't exist because happiness is an emotion. Emotion cannot exist for a very long time because by definition, an emotion is short-term. An emotion is temporary. So even if you are very angry at someone, you cannot be angry every second of every day for the next two months. Because in, in between, you will still experience uh, different kinds of emotions. There will be some days where you experience happiness, some days where you experience sadness and grief, some days where you experience anxiety. You cannot hold one emotion for a very long time. It's just, it's virtually impossible. So to make insan chase this dream where he will eventually attain long-term happiness is ridiculous because it doesn't exist. It cannot even be attained. So then, you know, the next question is, well, if the Quran is making it very clear that this cannot be attained and that this is not the rational thing to do, then why is it that a, a majority of us keep falling into this trap? Why is it that very few of us are able to take a step back, see exactly the, the mistake that we're making, and end up chasing the thing that will give us long-term sukoon, long-term contentment and peace. You know, the one thing that will give us long-term satisfaction, and that is a connection with Allah. Why is it that so few of us are able to see it? Or why is it that in the first couple of years in, of our life, the first 20, 30 years, we find it so difficult to see this, but it's only later on in life that suddenly it, it hits us, that, you know, chasing this dunya is only giving me um, incredible anxiety and stress and fear. This is, not ex this is not what I wanted. This is not what I was expecting. 
And that's when we realize where we've been chasing the wrong thing. Why is it so deceptive? And the reason that this dunya is so deceptive, the reason why, despite knowing that our wants are unlimited and long-term happiness does not exist, yet we still keep falling into this trap, and we will continue doing so, is because this dunya can be seen. Everything inside of it can be seen. When we see people buying a new car and then they're so happy and they're smiling, we can see that. When we see people who have been able to attain top grades, you know, or, or they just got admission into the best university and they're celebrating and they're so happy, that is something we can see. So the kind of things that we should be abstaining from, the kind of things that the Quran tells us can never give you long-term happiness. Unfortunately, when you see someone who has attained it, for a moment, what you see is that person being very happy. So the mind of your brain deceives us in believing that, no, these things can give you happiness because I just saw the person and he's so happy. You know, these kinds of things can give you long-term satisfaction because I ended up seeing so many people on social media. You know, they posted all of their pictures, they have all of these things in dunya and they seem to be really enjoying. So it's so hard for us to rewire our mind and to make us understand that, no, these things are just momentary uh, images of happiness. These things cannot actually give us a full, content and peaceful heart. On the other hand, the things that Allah tells us can give us contentment and sukoon are things that we cannot see. Not a single one of those things can be seen. Whether it's God, whether it's the angels, heaven, hell, you know, any of the things that Allah describes over here, these are things we cannot see. In fact, even the prophets are, are part of Bil Ghaib for us because we've never had the opportunity of seeing them. So really, when it comes to the things that really matter, it's hard, it's really hard to convince ourselves every day or to remind ourselves that that is what we must be chasing because these are all things that cannot be scientifically proven. When Allah tells us that in Jannah we will experience eternal happiness, right? This concept of long-term happiness, which does not exist in this dunya, it will exist in the Akhira inside Jannah. But then again, it's very hard for us to imagine that because we've never been able to see Jannah. We've not even been given a glimpse of Jannah. Okay, we have these amazing descriptions here uh, in the Quran, amazing stories, but that's it. That's what we have to uh, rely on. And this is precisely the reason why Allah says that the competition keeps deceiving us until we hit the grave. Because the minute the angel of death appears, that's when reality suddenly opens up. And, you know, I, I often ex explain this using an example of those 3D uh, virtual glasses that sometimes we have. You know, when you put them on, it's like you're playing a game and it seems as if the game is actually real. It seems as if whatever it is that is playing on inside that virtual game it appears to actually be existing all around you. And it feels so incredibly real that if you see something in that game charging towards you, your heart starts to race, you start to palpitate, you start to sweat, your body goes into fight and flight mode, even though your mind knows that this is actually a deception. Your mind knows that this is just the game. But on the other hand, your body automatically starts to react. So it's so interesting that even though you know that this is not real, your mind sort of plays a trick on you and your body reacts as if it is real. And that's precisely what happens in this dunya. That, you know, one part of us keeps telling us this isn't real, this isn't real, this is all a deception. None of this will, uh, will help me in the grave. None of this will help me when I'm standing in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. But on the other hand, the other part of our mind convinces us that no, we still need to chase this because we still need it. And so it is only when the angel of death appears, that is when the, uh, those 3D glasses are removed. That is when we are given a glimpse of what actual reality is. And that's why I always say there is no greater deception than life and there is no greater reality than death. And that is why uh, later on in the same surah, Allah then says in verses 3 and 4, no you are going to know, eventually, no, you are going to know. Now you can see that Allah is repeating his words and we can understand when as human beings do we repeat something. When we're talking to somebody and we say, do you understand? Do you understand? Right? The only time we, we repeat something is when we really want to stress it. 
when we really want the other person to know that we are very serious about what we're saying. And that is what you see over here, Allah saying. Allah saying that you will definitely know what reality is, for sure, guaranteed, you are going to know, which means me and you, we cannot escape death. We cannot escape that day of judgment. It's just virtually impossible, which is why in the previous surahs as well, we saw that Allah is explaining to us that, you know, it doesn't matter where you hide. It doesn't matter how deep down into the ground you are buried. Allah will be able to get you out. And he will be able to ensure that, we, that you are standing in front of Allah with all your deeds, good deeds and bad deeds, everything ready to be weighed so that the day of accountability can start. And then Allah says, no, if you only knew with knowledge of certainty. And this part again is also very important because, you know, when we study these surahs, we normally think Allah is talking to the disbelievers because the disbelievers don't have certainty. They don't believe in the Akhirah. They don't believe in Jahannam and Jannah or they don't take it seriously. But the truth is that this applies equally to us. It applies equally to those who call themselves Muslims because we don't take these things very seriously either. We don't have absolute certainty either because if we did have absolute certainty, we would be so attached to the Qur'an every single day. You know, we would give ourselves a dose of, of tafsir at least 20-25 minutes a day. We would make time for Allah's message because we would be terrified that we don't want to move back towards this dunya. We don't want to start chasing people again. We don't want to start chasing this world again because that only leads towards depression and anxiety. Right? This is why Allah says to all insan, not just uh, disbelievers, but also to believers, that the truth is we don't have yaqeen. Because if we had yaqeen, our behavior would be a lot different. If we had yaqeen, then a majority of our young population today would not be suffering from depression and grief and fear of the future. And so Allah says, you will surely see the hellfire, and then you will surely see it with the eye of certainty, and then you will surely be asked that day about pleasure. And interestingly, Allah says that what will we be asked about on the day of judgment? About our worldly pleasure, about the things that we were so consumed about, about the things we were so busy chasing because we believe that this will give us enjoyment. This will be able to give us long lasting fulfillment. And in that chase to attain those worldly pleasures, we completely forgot that there is a day of judgment. We completely forgot that we have a mission, we have a purpose. We were not created to chase these dreams. We were not created to enjoy this world. We were created for something far more important. And also what is very interesting you see in the surah, as well as in the other surahs that come towards the end of the Quran, is Allah keeps talking about Jahannam. So here as well he says, you will certainly see Jahannam. But he could also say, you will certainly see Jannah. He could also make some statement about Jannah, but he says, no, you will certainly see Jahannam. And this is interesting because what we know in the Hadith is that everyone will get a glimpse of Jahannam at that time. So even those who will be saved from Jahannam, they will get a glimpse of it in order to see that this is what they have been able to escape because of their amazing and beautiful deeds. That is what is going to make them love and appreciate Jannah so much more because when you have that contrast, when you see what it is that you have been able to escape, Jannah will, will be so much more beautiful for us knowing how merciful Allah has been at that time. On the contrary, Allah cannot say you will all certainly see Jannah because not everyone will be able to see Jannah. Only those who are deserving will be able to actually see it. Those who are not deserving will not even be given a glimpse of Jannah. But then again, we could still say that towards the end of the surah, Allah could have made some mention of Jannah. So, you know, while he's talking about Jahannam and the fire, he could have made some mention about Jannah. And you will see this, as I mentioned in the other surahs too, that there seems to be a lot of emphasis on Jahannam and much less emphasis on Jannah. Similarly, you will see there's a lot of emphasis upon Allah and the day of accountability and Allah's, Allah questioning the people, questioning his slaves. But there's less talk about Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. On the other hand, when you look at the beginning of the Quran, for instance, in the very first chapter, when you look at Surah Fatiha, Allah mentions himself as being a rahman a rahim And then throughout the Quran, you will see so much mention of Allah 
being uh, incredibly ghafoor, being incredibly kind and merciful, abiding himself by the law of mercy, always willing to forgive those who seek uh, his forgiveness, you know, always being the, the most merciful, the most compassionate. So that you actually see throughout the Qur'an, but towards the very ending of the Qur'an, it's mostly about Jahannam. It's mostly about punishment. It's mostly about the day of accountability and the day of judgment. And one of the reasons, of course, Allah knows best, but one of the reasons for this could be is that the biggest problem that we have as human beings is that we tend to take Allah's mercy for granted. We tend to take Allah's love for granted. And that is one thing that can make insan go off track. If you fear Allah so much that you forget about his love, that can paralyze you because then you end up losing hope. And on the other hand, if you love Allah so much that you forget to fear his Jahannam, then that can also paralyze you. Both situations are bad, which is why Allah says you have to balance. You have to have this balance between hope and fear. If you have too much fear, then you will end up moving towards despair. And you will think that Allah will never allow you to go into Jannah, so your life is practically over. And if you have too much hope, then that can make you overconfident. Overconfident to the extent that, you know, even if there are certain commands of Allah that you are ignoring, you just won't mind because you've convinced yourself, Allah is a Rahman, He will forgive me. Even if you're not struggling, even if there's no jihad that, that you're actually doing, you won't mind, you won't actually have any guilt inside of you because you've convinced yourself that if Allah is al ghafur He has to forgive me. You know, there's no way that such a kind and loving God would throw me into Jahannam. That's overconfidence. So what we see is that throughout the Qur'an, while Allah was stressing about being Rahman and being Rahim and constantly telling us that He's ready, He's there to forgive us, now towards the very end, when this book is about to end, Allah keeps informing us that you need to start taking religion seriously. And for you to take it seriously, don't become overconfident. Don't take Allah's mercy for granted. Yes, His mercy is infinite. Yes, His mercy is so much, it's hard for us to even imagine. But it is not something that should be taken for granted. Jahannam is incredibly real. The hellfire that has been prepared for those who did not take this life seriously, that did not strive or struggle in the cause of Islam, that is a Jahannam that is very real and it's a hellfire that needs to be feared. And that is what Allah keeps telling us as we approach the end of the Qur'an in Juz 30. We have to constantly remind ourselves to be vigilant. We have to constantly remind ourselves that respect and honor does not lie in the hands of society. It lies in the hands of Allah. So when we start to believe and we start to tell ourselves that attaining a certain amount of, of grades, getting a certain job, being married at a certain age, or you know, having a successful career and a successful marriage, all of these things will give us respect and honor from society, that is false because society will never give you respect and honor. You will never be able to come up to, to the standards of society because society itself has unlimited wants. Right? If insan has un unlimited wants, then so does society. Society keeps changing its benchmarks. It keeps trying to change its standards. So you can never attain the standard of society. It's virtually impossible. You're chasing something that can never be attained. On the other hand, what it does end up leading to is depression and anxiety because the more you chase it, the further away it actually it becomes. And eventually you just get exhausted. And that is when we have a generation of people who are suffering from depression and grief, or you start to have incredible fear of, of failure. So life for you becomes attaining a certain amount of grades. Life for you means you have to be very successful with a great career, with a great income at a certain age, because that is what is expected of you. And that for you becomes life. And if you're not able to attain that goal, then that means you are a failure. And so this, this inculcates the fear of failure. This inculcates the fear of not being able to attain your dream and therefore being less worthy or less valuable than your peers. So what Allah keeps reminding us in the surahs is that you will get as much of dunya as has been destined for you. But that isn't the, the reason you were created. If you're not able to attain your goal, you will still be a very valuable and a very successful person in the eyes of Allah depending on how much you chased him, depending on how much of the mission, the purpose for which you were created, you kept in mind, right? Your worth and your value has nothing to do with this world. 
you being a success or a failure has nothing to do with what you acquire in this world. And of course, as we have seen in this surah, this is something we have to constantly remind ourselves. You cannot remind yourself about this today, feel better about yourself, and then assume that now you've learned your lesson and you will never go off track again. You will unless you keep reminding yourself about this every day. That is why Allah tells us from the demonstration of Adam salam and his wife in the gardens that insan's biggest problem is we keep forgetting. And this world keeps deluding us because it appears to, to be so real. And people's smiles and enjoyment and happiness, as soon as they're able to acquire something of dunya, it looks so real. And that is what we crave, that is what we want as well, without realizing it's fake, it's not real at all. And, you know, by the way, this is one of the biggest problems that we all make in the month of Ramadan. Every year in Ramadan, we get attached to the Quran. We start listening to all kinds of speakers. We start really trying to understand the words of Allah. And we feel this beautiful enlightenment. We feel this burden that has been lifted. And, you know, we, it's just like life suddenly makes so much more sense to us. But by the time we reach the next Ramadan next year, we are in that same state of depression again. And then we need that next year's Ramadan to again uplift us. And we're not able to stop and ask ourselves, why is it that in that one month we feel uplifted and then the remaining 11 months we go back down to the same depression, grief and fear. It's like, you know, over time we're not progressing. We're not getting any better. We're not, we haven't been able to improve ourselves. We are the same person that we were 15 years ago. There's no change we're still suffering from the same problems. We're still chasing the same dreams. And this is why the Quran is so important. It's not just something you attach yourself to in the month of Ramadan. It is a dose that you need every day. Because you and I, we will forget it. We will forget our mission. We will forget our purpose and we will move back towards that cycle of greed that is just never ending. May Allah help us all to fill our hearts with the nur of Allah, with the words of the Qur'an. May Allah help us all to attach ourselves to this Qur'an in this month and in the remaining 11 months of the year. And may Allah forgive us all of our sins and help us all to attain salvation. Assalamu alaikum.